Um, last Sunday, the country was celebrating Memorial Day, where we commemorate our fallen heroes. And uh, it all fits for Jesus. The idea of uh, they gave up their lives uh, so that we might enjoy freedom and so on and so forth. All of that fits with Jesus. And indeed, he is our greatest fallen hero. And now, uh, let's pray as we go into the Word. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I speak a blessing upon your Word. But bless your Word that it would go forward now into our hearts and minds. Lord, I take authority over every distracting element of the enemy and command it to stop. Father, we thank you so much. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Okay, so. Who is Jesus? And this can be uh, kind of Christianity 101. But it behooves us to ask the question in this day and age of religious pluralism, you know, where um, people say that there are many roads to God, many roads to heaven. Um, that Jesus is, uh, was a, a good teacher, that he was just one of the prophets. Who is Jesus? We call him our greatest fallen hero. But as believers, we should always approach these things from a scriptural perspective, from a biblical perspective. In other words, what does the Bible say? Not what this one and that one says. Not what is politically correct. <clears throat> Who is Jesus? Jesus is God. Let me say that again. Jesus is God. Now, God has expressed himself in three persons. And uh, some people find that hard to grasp. And I'm not going to do a big teaching on the Trinity uh, right now. But I, I, I guess I need to. I do it every now and then. But God said in the book of Genesis, let us make man in our image. Jesus was right there, included in the us and in the our. Our, it says, our image. In the first few words of the book of Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It says, in the beginning, God, the word God right there is Elohim, and it, it is the plural form of the word God. El, he is you know, our God, or uh, Eloi, my God. When we say Elohim, uh, it, it literally means gods. Uh, but we don't serve many gods as in various uh, pagan religions. There is only one God. But this one God expresses himself to three persons. Jesus is there in what we call the Godhead. Now, he's God. Let me give you some scripture to back that up. And I can give you, I can give you a lot of it. But uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to give you Colossians chapter 1. Talking about Jesus. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his son, of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He 
He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And when it says the firstborn, it simply means that he has preeminence. Okay? It goes on to say, for by him all things were created. Okay? That's scriptural proof of that Jesus is God. Because Jesus is the creator. For by him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, were the thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This is the idea that God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And that helps us understand that when Jesus was here on earth 2,000 years ago, walking the ground as you and I do. He was fully God, yet fully man. Okay? You all understand that? He wasn't just a man. He was fully God, but fully man. And which is why he did the things that he did. Those demonstrations of authority, walking on water, raising the dead, and so on and so forth. Now, look at the look at verse 20. It says, and through him, through Jesus, God wanted to reconcile to himself all things. Whether things on earth, uh, things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus came in human form to be the last all-sufficient blood sacrifice for sin. Why was that necessary? Because scripture tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sin. Why is that Why is it like that? Because the wages of sin, the payment for sin is death. So in payment for sin, some, something's got to die. This is to appease God's sense of justice and holiness. And during the Old Testament times, they used to sacrifice a sheep or a lamb or a bull and shed its blood. But God said, let's do this in a big way, once and for all. Let's have one blood sacrifice that will cover the sins of the whole world for generations and generations to come. And that's why Jesus came and shed his blood on the cross. Okay, which leads me to my second point. He is God and he's the Savior. He was born to be the Savior of the world. Remember how, and we quoted every Christmas, how the uh, shepherds were out in the field keeping watch over their flocks by night. And suddenly the angel of the Lord appeared to them and says, Help us, bring it. You know, uh, don't freak out or, or, or fear not. I, give, I bring you good news that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. 
Again, okay, um, he was born to be the savior of the world. He came to save us from our sins. From having to suffer the penalty for our sins. That's what it means. Jesus saved me from my sins. What does that mean? It means that, that, that because of my faith in him and the work that he did for me on the cross, I am saved from having to pay for the penalty of my sins. Okay? That's what it means to be saved from my sins. I'm saved from having to continue in them, and I'm saved from having to suffer the penalty. I'm free from having to stay, stay enslaved by my sins. And make no mistake about it, sin enslaves people. <clears throat> people do, you know, I thought, well, 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 drugs for instance, this, that's a, a common, easy example of among us. People uh, do drugs and then they get strung out on them and next thing you know the drug is doing them. Okay. And they find themselves having to serve the drug. The world has a saying, they said that so-and-so's got a monkey on his back. And the monkey runs his life. That's, that's a practical example of being enslaved by sin. Jesus came to set us free from all of this. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that you don't have to say, don't have to stay messed up? That you don't have to stay enslaved to sin? That, that, that your sins can be forgiven? And not just forgiven, but we can be set free from them. Okay, and remember the scripture that we started out with. I'm going to back this up. I'm going to go back there. Yeah. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son of God. Before we came to Christ, we lived under the, the dominion of darkness, where darkness ruled over our lives, whether we thought so or not. But he rescued us. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. That's part of what it means to be the Savior. That he is a rescuer. Amen. He's a savior. And again, I got a little bit, bit ahead of myself earlier. Uh, the angel appeared uh, to the shepherds. Again, this is the scripture that we read all the time. Um, it's Christmas. And the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you uh, good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the, in the town of David, a Savior has been born for you. He is Christ the Lord. Again, born to be a Savior. He died on the cross for your sins. He died on the cross for our sins. He shed his blood as that last, all-sufficient blood sacrifice. Remember, in the Old Testament, they had to, as a, as a uh, sacrifice for their sins, they had to bring an animal to the priest. And the priest would kill the animal and shed its blood. Um, and that was the grace of God in action. Uh, God, uh, for, for, for this person to get their sins forgiven, God said, you can bring a sheep and, and have that sheep shed its blood for your sins. That way the person didn't have to die for their And this thing of Jesus shedding his blood on the cross for our sins, this was God's plan from the very beginning. It was prophesied in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah which says Isaiah um, chapter 53, 
talking about Jesus. Now again, this was written hundreds of years before Jesus was born. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Again, this is Jesus being a Savior. This is what his dying on the cross did for us. This is what it means. And, and I, I, I love this, this. I'm going to give you this one verse out of the ninth chapter of the book of Hebrews. But now... He has appeared once for all, talking about Jesus, at the end of the ages, to do away with sin. How? By the sacrifice of himself. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And again, on uh, Memorial Day, which was last weekend, uh, we remember and honor our fallen heroes who, who made the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom. We give praise to the ultimate hero who laid down his life so that we could be free from sin. Jesus gave the ultimate sacrifice. And we like to say on Memorial Day, or any time that we look at the idea of people dying on the battlefield, we like to say, remember, freedom isn't free. For us to enjoy the freedom that we enjoy now, in our country, somebody had to die to preserve it. Because there were people, Hitler, Emperor Hirohito, in Japan, so on and so forth. There are people who would take it from us and have us serve them. And it has happened down through history, time and time again. We have it in the Bible. Okay? Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, goes and, and uh, takes Israel. Takes them. Sends an army in there and takes them captive and take and ships a whole lot of them off to, off to Babylon to serve in Babylon. And again, that's why the language of the Old Testament changed from Hebrew to Chaldean because of the Babylonian captivity. All those biblical writers got taken to Babylon and reprogrammed, re-educated, assimilated. I spoke of this a little bit last Sunday. But it's those who got on the battlefield help them in that. <clears throat> freedom isn't free. We enjoy freedom in Christ now. We, we can say, I'm free from my sins. I don't, I don't have to continue to be enslaved in their world. That costs somebody something. And the somebody is Jesus. Now, indeed, I'm calling him uh, the ultimate fallen hero, but the, but the cool thing about this fallen hero is that he rose again. Okay? 
Uh, he died. He died on the cross. They, they crucified him, which is actually a, sort of a ghastly way to die. <coughs> suffocation. A full suffocation, painful. And he rose again from the dead on the third day. Now, I, I started this by asking, who is Jesus? He's God, he's the Savior. The Savior who died on the cross for our sins. Now, let me deal with this. He's the only way to get to heaven. Now, now, now wait a minute, Pastor Bill. What about all the other religions of the world? How can you say that Jesus is the only one, only way to get to heaven? What about all of the, the Hindus in India and all of the Buddhists? What about over a billion Muslims around the world and the people who are of the Baha'i and, and the Japanese Shinto, uh, people who practice Shintoism in Japan. What about the, the, all of the Chinese Taoists and Confucius and so on and so forth? What about <coughs> them? Well, the Christian church sends missionaries to these places to point them to Jesus. You know, I wish there were many roads to heaven. It would make it all simpler. You know what I mean? But I have to tell you what the Bible says. Now make no mistake, the Bible is not politically correct. Which is one of the reasons people throw stones at it. <laughs> Acts chapter 4. Verse 12 says, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name <coughs> under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. No other name. You see, if there was another way, Jesus would have said, there's a way right over there. Take that way. Don't Go crucify me, stick a nail in my hands. That's a perfectly good, acceptable way to go to heaven. Go, go that way. But he didn't. He made the way. He made the way. Remember the angel in like Luke, Luke chapter 2. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Again, and the angel said, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. All the people. <clears throat> and we say, Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. I firmly believe that. Because the Bible firmly teaches that. We sing the song in Angels bow before him, heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. That's true. Angels bow before him, <coughs> heaven and earth adore him. And, and he is so much more. <coughs> and I give you quickly, very quickly, I give you um, merely 25 of of his names found in scripture and found in the Bible. And I, I'm only going to give you 25 of them. Um, he is the Alpha and the Omega. And there's a scripture reference where, where, where he is referred to that. He is the author of life. He is the perfecter, the author and perfecter of our faith. He is the beginning and the end, the, the blessed and the and only ruler. 
He is the bread of life. He is faithful and true. He is the great shepherd. He is the head of the church. He is the heir of all things. He is the eternal king. He's king of kings and lord of lords. He's king of the ages. He is the lamb of God. He is the light of the world. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the Lord of all. He is the Lord of glory. He is our great God and Savior. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the truth. He is the way. He is the wonderful counselor. He is the Word of God. And he will be your saving Jesus or your sentence in church. Amen. You hear that? He will be your saving Jesus or your sentence in church. You will never be who you were meant to be without Jesus. The, the big question, oh, why were we born? What is the meaning of life? Oh, wise guru. <laughs> you know, we, we see such questions posed on TV and what have you. You'll never find out who you're meant to be without having that life submitted to Jesus. Once you submit your life to him, that's when you find out why you were here. You're not just here to limp along and try to make things work and make a buck and try not to starve and so on and so forth. You are here to make a difference. You are here to shine the glory of God and let Him work for you. You see, He takes the life that He gave us and gives it purpose, gives its meaning. Nothing gives it purpose. But He gives this life, your individual life, your purpose, okay? If you never knew what you were here for, I'm telling you how to find out. 